Hello, welcome to my channel where I like to discuss things. Today I wanted to dive into the dark world of self-help. The self-help industry is pretty broad and it can include things like books, seminars, online courses, workshops, retreats, coaching lessons, psychics, and even just consuming self-help media in general. That is oftentimes selling or sharing a formula to happiness, peace, and success. The value in self-knowledge lies in the fact that the self is really the only constant in life. Therefore, being clear on your attitude and thoughts and patterns can really help you manage a day-to-day -day life that is constantly changing. I just wanna clarify really quick what this video is not about. I think it would be equally as bad to tell someone not to engage in any self-help as it would be to excessively engage and consume self-help because that leads to the same type of black and white thinking that we're about to get into. What I am proposing is that we reassess our relationship to self-improvement and what it means to us and our trust in these industries through a more pragmatic and critical lens. And I want to personally say that I really do value the concept of self-help. It has brought a lot of extremely beneficial and eye-opening lessons to my life. I truly do value self-knowledge, I think, more than anything except my relationship with those that I love the most. But I started to notice a pattern. I would engage in a self-help activity and feel really motivated and inspired shortly after like reading a book or taking a workshop, um, but that would never really last. And I would crash shortly after, whether that be a few months after or a few weeks after. And I actually asked this question in a poll to my Instagram followers, and I was surprised to see that pretty much everyone agreed with this concept of hitting a plateau or feeling stuck at some point in your self-help journey. I started to really ask myself if the self-help industry is really as helpful as they make it out to be, why is it growing and we are not? Why am I still digging and searching for answers and new ways to be happy? Why was I never content or satisfied with who I was? Was it just me? Was I the problem? Was I just unfixable? The route to self-improvement the majority of the time usually stems from a sense of dissatisfaction with who we are currently. While I think that there's nothing inherently wrong with wanting to improve a certain aspect of your life, I just wanna make note of this because I think that this tends to put us in a very emotionally vulnerable mindset and we become susceptible to some problematic rhetoric sometimes. We can certainly learn a lot from stepping out of the box and learning new ideas, having seeds planted in our mind. But in my opinion, constantly consuming self-improvement content for the sake of feeling like you just need to always improve can reinstate the belief that we always need fixing, all while following someone else's idea of what a perfect person is, or while following the narrative that you might need to search outside of yourself for answers or for purpose or for meaning in life. And while I think that searching for purpose inherently can make a person happier, I do think that the more we tend to search for it outside of ourselves, ironically, but also not ironically, the more disconnected we are from our true authentic selves, if that makes sense. And I'm not saying that I know what my true purpose in life is, but I feel closest to it when I'm living authentically in the moment, in engaging in something that makes me feel passionate and feeling grateful for that. Which is something I kept coming back to while researching the criticism towards self-help was 
acceptance and gratitude. I've already discussed toxic positivity in my new age spirituality video. So if you haven't checked that out, I highly suggest you watch it. But after this video, essentially toxic positivity is just the assumption that regardless of someone, whether that be you or someone else's emotional pain or difficult situation, they should remain positive or have good vibes only. So in my new age video, I discuss how this can be problematic, not only towards people with disability and mental illness and chronic illness, but also towards people in marginalized communities who are experiencing oppression and racism. If you wanna hear me rant about that, like I said, you can watch that video after. I don't wanna to be too redundant, but I do wanna talk about something that has become very popular on social media, especially this year, and that is pop psychology or popular psychology. So back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, people had a very misconstrued opinion on what psychology was, oftentimes thinking that it had a lot to do with mind reading or spiritualism. The rise of applied psychology helped to popularize psychology in general. So in literal terms, pop psychology just means popular psychology. However, nowadays, the common understanding of pop psychology is that it is pseudoscience or pseudopsychology and often based on myth type culture. These theories are often popularized by books, um, magazines, talk shows, or even talked about by non-psychologists, which has commonly been referred to as psychobabble. Psychobabble is a form of speech or writing that uses psychological jargon, buzzwords, and esoteric language to create an impression of truth or plausibility. Some examples of popular psychology beliefs that are now proven to be myths include opposites attract, the idea of learning styles, law of attraction, and to my surprise, even the concept of the subconscious. And while I do see the benefit of stepping outside of institutionalized methods every now and then to explore your options, I also think that the purpose of research is to add more credibility to out-of-the-box ideas. My next point is the false sense of enlightenment. A lot of self-help industry tactics aim to sell you this idea that at one point after you've meditated enough or read enough books or gone to enough of these workshops or practiced enough of these skills and that after you've attained a certain level of knowledge, you somehow will be able to exceed all of life's biggest challenges. But as I said earlier, this tends not to be true, hence why we all keep coming back to it and tend to form an addiction with self-help. So I love learning about cognitive biases and I was reading an article that mentioned the self-perception theory, which basically theorizes that whenever someone is unsure of how they feel, they tend to use their behavior to infer how they feel. A simple example of this could be um, to convince yourself that since you are eating a salad, then that must mean that you value healthy eating, even if you know deep down that might not be necessarily true. If you view someone at a park recycling a bottle, then you might make the assumption that that person values environmental causes. Do you see the correlation? While I think I was really introduced to a lot of amazing concepts during my self-help journey, I think I probably overestimated how much growth I actually went through at times, often even contradicting and eating my own words. I truly do see the value in consuming the content, don't get me wrong, but I think that doing that just alone without taking any action steps, like I said, to fix the current issues in your life is kind of counterproductive and can often even give you the illusion of progression. I just wanna say that this doesn't apply for people who struggle with mental illness or depression. I understand that sometimes even just waking up and taking a shower is productive. That 
is completely valid. I've been there. I struggle with mental illness as well, but I do think that I improved the most when I got professional help versus when I tried to self-help, but that's a whole other subject. You can be busy all day, but still not effectively working towards the goals or solving the problems that are in your life. And I know I keep saying that. I hope that this doesn't contradict my anti-hustle segment later because I'm really not all about hustle culture at all, but I do think that it's important to be real with ourselves. And if we're facing an issue, I think it's important to recognize when we are avoiding it in the name of still trying to be productive, if that makes sense. So for an example, I used to make lists that I thought were productive just to avoid my real productive tasks. Um, like for example, wake up, shower, cook myself breakfast, do a face mask later, post on Instagram. I would call that like a very productive day like five years ago. And I think for some people that's valid if that's where you wanna be productivity wise, but I was basically fooling myself. I would often feel like this sense of dissonance or conflict because I knew that deep down at the end of the day, I didn't feel any closer to achieving my goal or solving that issue. And trust me, I don't think that we should always be progressing. In fact, I think by the end of the video, you'll realize it's quite the opposite. And that's the thing. We shouldn't always be progressing and we shouldn't always feel like we need to progress or like we are progressing. Sometimes we're really just not. And whenever I was writing this video, I thought about the concept of performative allyship without taking any action steps or any educational steps to actually be an ally to the black community. That's kind of unrelated, but in a way it's not because that's the type of accountability I wanna have with myself. I don't want my self-help to just be performative self-help to just get me through the days. And that's the thing, we rarely just do one self-help thing. Often times it will spiral one into a rabbit hole of self-help media, webinars, books, online courses, workshops, retreats. The next best way to improve your life, become wealthier, become healthy. My next point is that addiction aspect. I remember that I used to fill my Amazon cart with a bunch of self-help shit. And looking back, that feels problematic because I was just blindly partaking in this consumerism. It's totally not a bad thing to like love something and have a hobby and buy something related to that hobby. But I think mindfully, I didn't realize that for me personally in doing this, I was basically like predetermining the narrative that I will always need fixing. But aside from that, I was very addicted to that ego-driven high of just having accomplished or achieved something. I think especially living in this short-term consumerism for pleasure culture, it was very easy for me to just always want like a quick punch of wisdom or an emotionally satisfying explanation to something without really having to think about the long run or creating long-term action steps. It's always searching for that illusion of progress, but looking back, if I was really progressing, then why did I keep coming back? Why did I still feel the need to progress? I've come to notice that part of my real healing journey through therapy and support and a little bit of self-care and self-help in moderation was that need to constantly improve and constantly progress. Like, holy shit, is it so liberating to just accept myself for once. 1010, highly recommend. And that's the thing, like oftentimes I would finish something, feel really motivated, feel really good, and just search for something else. It's like, why couldn't I just reap in the gratitude of that book and really understand and apply that knowledge first. Just always felt like I was never quite there. But that's the thing, what is even there? And will we ever really get there if we're always searching for there? I believe that I and other fellow self-improvement junkies have this subtle form of FOMO or fear of missing out, but it's more like fear of missing out of the next skill or the next big thing or the next big technique or the 
final piece of the puzzle. In reality, I feel like we'll never really be satisfied so long as we're in a state of constant disapproval. Another problem that I struggled with whenever I felt like I always needed to have my self-improvement switch on was the conflict that I felt whenever I did something that wasn't self-improvement related. It kind of reminds me of orthorexic thinking except with self-help culture. There are a lot of self-healing concepts and ideas and consumerism out there to be consumed. So it is very easy to feel like you're missing out on that golden nugget, on that last piece of your puzzle to peace, success, happiness, and health. So therefore we start rushing to fill up our lives with value and novelty and meaningful activities. And I also believe that it has a detrimental effect on our ability to just be present and enjoy the playful and funner, lighter aspects of life. I think that being obsessed with doing self-help and self-healing stuff all the time is definitely something that I struggled with a little bit. Like I would feel really guilty if I read a fiction book. Actually, I didn't even ever want to because I only thought I should be reading self-improvement books. And I would feel really guilty when I would watch like the Kardashians or any type of reality TV. After all these years of engaging in self-healing culture, I found personally that the only way to self-actualize is to stop constantly trying to fight who you are and the present moment. And I just keep coming back to gratitude and acceptance, individualism and collectivism. So I recently started learning about the philosophies and concepts of individualist societies and cultures versus collectivist cultures. And I actually found these topics to be pretty interesting and relative to a lot of things in life. I just wanna read um, off a post on Instagram that I really resonate with. It reads, individualism is defined as a philosophy and way of living that prioritizes an individual over community. This is a colonial ideology that fuels the racist capitalist system. Most Western cultures are individualistic. An individual's rights take higher precedence and depending on others is considered shameful. Collectivism is defined as a principle that prioritizes the needs of community and the interconnectedness of people within the group over an individual. Most global South and indigenous cultures are collectivist. Working together and supporting one another to achieve the community's well-being is essential. So I really resonate with collectivism and the ideas of a collectivist culture. It reads at the bottom, although balance is key, extreme individualism in and from Western cultures has contributed tremendously to social injustices and environmental exploitation. The profit and benefit of the individual is more valuable than the well-being of the community and ecosystem that they are hurting. So this Instagram post is directly in reference to how Maslow's hierarchy of needs chart integrates with today's pop psychology concepts of self-healing and the emphasis on self-reliance. Now, I just want to say I'm not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, and I'm not too familiar with Abraham Maslow, but I do believe that human needs are non-hierarchical and that there should be more of a balance between the collective and the self. I don't think that the goal should always necessarily be self-actualization. And there really is a huge emphasis on self-independence in the self-help culture. I mean, literally, how many times have I said the word self in this video? But I believe that for every person, there usually comes a point in their life when these self-help tactics might not work for you. At that point, you might even need the help and support of those around you. You might even need professional help. For me, this was when my mother passed away last year. No matter how badly I wanted to apply all of my learned self-healing skills, to be honest, I could barely even remember them in the midst of my foggy grief and depression. And maybe asking for help even feels like a last resort because you've been ingrained with the belief that you should be able to self-heal. But in my opinion, we live in a naturally collective society and I believe that we tend to heal faster with the validation and support of our loved ones and strong interpersonal relationships. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with having introverted personality traits. I just think 
think that it can be easy to stray away from wanting to work on like conflict resolution and communication skills and interpersonal skills in general even more when you're obsessing over self actualization. And instead, you might find yourself leaning even more into counter dependent tendencies like rejecting help or passive aggressive communication. The capitalism of self help and fake gurus. So like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, self help is a very broad industry, it can include books, CDs, seminars, courses, retreats, coaching, podcasts, oftentimes selling that formula to success, even though obviously none of the formulas are working since the industry is so broad. The self-help industry is worth $13.5 billion and they basically run off of the idea that we need improving. So it would be kind of naive for us not to conclude that we are more profitable to the self-help industry, unhappy and discontent than we are happy and satisfied. And oftentimes these self-help authors and gurus, etc., will leave you little trail crumbs to another CD, another workshop, another book. Like you just read the four agreements, you're feeling good, but wait, there is a fifth agreement. And don't even get me started on people like Tony Robbins and Deepak Chopra, who's literally written like a hundred books about the same topic and profiting off of a workshop or seminar or online course about the book as well. Fake Gurus, I think is a whole other video I could make in and of itself. I truly think that it is a huge problem that doesn't get enough traction. The biggest problem is the way that we idolize these people who are essentially also just businessmen or businesswomen capitalizing off of our unhappiness, but we are blindly trusting their hearsay advice and pseudo-psychology and even pseudoscience. Now, I'm not against the idea of reading a book to help you improve a certain aspect or area of your life. I just think that it's important to do your research on the author, make sure that there is some sort of evidence and also to notice how you feel whenever you're reading the book. Notice if they are trying to sell you this false hope or false idea or even another book or course. Let's talk about hustle culture. Hustle culture, just like the name implies, refers to the idea of constantly working all day. Not only working all day, but loving every second of it and glorifying the idea of extremely hard work. In this culture, the more you work, the more celebrated you are. Never mind how many meals or nights of sleep you have missed. This word actually has pretty racist origin. This idea was used in the early and mid 1900s to equate blackness to laziness and articles would often say things like the average black man does not know how to hustle. So this racist propaganda essentially perpetuated an idea that black people struggled because of their personal failures and not because of systemic oppression. So completely disregarding forces like redlining, school segregation, white violence, mass incarceration, and racism. So this word was essentially created to make black people work twice as hard hard for way less pay. Eventually, Malcolm X started to use this word to describe the grim reality of what poor black folks had to do on a day-to-day -day basis just to make ends meet. And eventually, rappers started to incorporate the idea of hustling into their songs to not only take ownership of the word, but to also switch the narrative towards black resilience. Like many concepts that originated in the black community, this word was then gentrified by white and large corporations to glamorize the experience of working all the time in an anti-black capitalist country. I know that nowadays it can go very 50-50. There are a lot of people in the self-help world preaching anti-hustle culture. I'm very aware of that, but 
For the sake of this video, let's just assume that this is in reference to people who are all about that hustle culture. Glorifying this idea of productivity and associating your identity with how much work you get done can leave us feeling exhausted, resentful, uncared for. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with working hard toward a dream, but I think that there is something a little bit problematic about the idea of working hard just for the sake of working hard. I think that this is due to the glorification of the American dream, the myth of meritocracy and capitalism. The myth of meritocracy is a phrase arguing that meritocracy or achieving upward social mobility through one's own merits, regardless of one's social position, is not widely attainable in capitalist societies because of inherent contradictions. Some scholars even argue that the wealth disparity has even increased because the myth of meritocracy has been so effectively promoted and defended by the political and private elite through the media, education, corporate culture, and elsewhere. So essentially, it just is this mass delusion that only perpetuates inequality because the people on top tend to look down on people beneath them with a sense of superiority because they truly think that they worked harder to get there. When in reality, the majority of the working and middle class work much harder than some of the richest billionaires in this world. Also perpetuates this misconception that if you work hard enough, you will get to the top. And obviously this idea is pretty laughable to buy POC who have been affected by white supremacy and oppressive systems for centuries now. And this pandemic, proves that a lot of these unskilled workers are not only essential, but are out here risking their lives just to get you fed and their families fed. To me, unfortunately, the real hustlers are not the hustlers and the ones who are on top but the ones who are having to work twice as hard just to make a basic living, not because they want to, but because they have to. And honestly, I think that if it were up to them, they would definitely probably choose to spend more time at home with their families and not hustling. So is this really a word that we should be glorifying? Like I mentioned a few times in this video, I keep coming back to gratitude and acceptance. And not only that, but doing things that I feel genuinely passionate about. I used to think that I was passionate about self-improvement, but looking back now, I just see that I was addicted to it. I truly do not think that we need all of this consumerism in order to improve. And not only that, but I also don't think that we are meant to be improving or progressing all the time anyway. So there's really no point in having to fool yourself into thinking that you are because it's completely okay to just be you authentically existing in this moment right here and right now and be completely grateful for that. I wanted to fully conclude this video with an excerpt from an interview with a psychologist and he was essentially asked, how can you go about improving without getting overconsumed with the self-help world? And his answer was, I find it very important to be interested in something beyond yourself. In my case, it could be something like philosophy or science or art or literature. Go into the world instead of staring into yourself. Try not to be so obsessed with happiness. You have this happiness imperative. Life is about being happy. It's ridiculous. Who said that happiness is all that? No one knows what happiness is. I think what is important is to pursue valuable and meaningful activities. Then if you do something meaningful, you will often feel a kind of happiness, but more as a side effect than as something that you can try to pursue directly. It doesn't make sense to pursue happiness directly. Very often what gives you meaning is something that you discover rather than something that you choose. This happiness industry, the most common slogan is happiness is a choice, which is a lie because your happiness, whatever it is, depends on so many factors that you cannot always really control. And I completely relate to that. Honestly, this YouTube channel has been a really huge creative and passionate outlet for me. 
and it has sparked something in me that I haven't felt in a really long time. I also feel the same way when I put on my roller skates that I recently just got and started to skate around and feel like a kid again. Um, I relate to that feeling when I used to take out my hula hoop and go hula hoop for fun. Just doing things that feel childlike and can help bring you to this present moment, but also spark a little bit of passion within yourself. I find that that mixed together with acceptance and gratitude is a really great recipe for happiness, at least for me. That about covers it. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I'm curious to hear your experience in the self-help realm and how you have benefited from it and maybe how it has affected you negatively. So feel free to leave a comment below and you can also follow me on social media at Aware with Alex and I will see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.